Right, before the groundswell of conversation gets too loud, I'm going to ask Christopher Hitchens to summarize what his feelings are at the end of this debate. Christopher. Um, I think I'll address myself principally to Dr. Spivey, who uh, has ducked the motion not by uh, saying that religion should be transcended, or would, we would be better off if it uh, were to be, but rather like Dr. Scruton has simply said, well, we can't hope to. We're stuck with it. Well, that's not what the motion says. The motion says, suppose we could, as some of us have, transcended the supernatural and the superstitious, would our example, if followed, not be a superior one? I think we've made a pretty strong case for that. Um, I'll correct him also on another point, a very common misapprehension, and I'll try and demonstrate in doing so that we are not on this side deaf to the numinous, as it were. It is flat out not true to say that Karl Marx referred to religion as an opiate or an opium. What he says, I can quote it from memory, from his uh, uh, contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, is this. He says, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, the spirit of the spiritless situation. It is an opiate for the sufferer, for the people. So he goes on to say, the demand to give up its illusion is the demand to give up the condition that requires illusions. And he f closes by saying that criticism has plucked the flowers from the chain, not so that men and women may wear the chain without consolation, but so that they may break the chain and cull the living flower. Now, that the fact that you've been lied to about what he said all this time by, by religious spokesmen shouldn't uh, conceal from you the knowledge that we have a, a very clear understanding of where this impulse comes. I actually don't like the Sistine Chapel. I didn't like it, I didn't like it even before I knew that every brick of St. Peter's was raised by the sale of indulgences, which obviously changes nothing for Dr. Scruton either, by a special sale of indulgences, by the way. But I do like the Parthenon very much, and I've written a book about it, and I think, I think of, as, as an achievement of artistic symmetry um, and architectural glory, it probably has no Christian rival. But I believe that I can, in fact I know I can, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has been there and said and appreciated and loved it without having to subscribe to the superstitions of the Eleusinian mysteries, to the cult of Athena and Zeus, to the Melian expedition and the Peloponnesian War, to slavery and Athenian imperialism, and to human sacrifice. We can have our Parthenon and we can indeed recover it from what was done to it by Byzantine Ottomans, by Venetian Catholics, uh, by National Socialist barbarians and many others, we can still have it. It's our common property without the superstitions that go with it, without the dread and fear and sacrifice, the, the terrified, cringing humanity that was so much sheltered uh, under the walls as it was being raised. And the word for that, the ability to have these things, to have John Milton's poetry, uh, to have Philip Larkin's uh, poem, Church Going, to have uh, Shakespeare, to have, without the superstition, is called culture, on which we've all laid our lives, on which we've all sworn to defend ourselves and our civilization against, especially now, precisely against religious barbarism, against those who know they are right, against those who say they only need one book, against those who say they know God's on their side, against those who say there's a revelation. That's what culture is, that's what we're defending. Yes, we'd be better off with culture, and yes, we can have it without religion, which is a mind-forged manacle. Thanks. Thank right. you.